Hi and welcome. I'm Terry Wright, a founder of Hot Spotting. And today we're discussing two subjects that don't immediately appear to be linked, using depreciation to improve your property investor returns and how to live your best life while achieving financial success. Now, the common denominator of these two themes is Tyron Hyde, who runs Australia's leading quantity surveying firm, Washington Brown, which makes him a leading expert on property depreciation. And he does it normally from a bamboo eco school in the iconic <laughs> Indonesian island of Bali. Hence the title of today's webinar, Life Appreciation and Property Depreciation. So to find out more, let's welcome Tyron Hyde from Washington Brown. Hi, Tyron. Hi, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, Terry. Um, this is a very unusual uh, topic I'm giving, but I'm look, looking forward to it. Yeah, well, I thought we'd um, just just spice up the conversation today. We, we've had a number of these conversations about how property investors can use uh, the depreciation benefits that are available to improve their bottom line and perhaps um, the degree to which um, way too many investors overlook the opportunities that are available there. But we also want to talk about your uh, your business story and, and how you've achieved the level of success and lifestyle that you have um, mm. over recent years. Um, yeah. Yep. It may well very well be a model for us all to follow. Mm. Well, I think this started, Terry, when I was speaking to you the other day and I was looking at whales from my house and you were like, do you ever work? Well, let's talk more about how, how come I always see you on, on Facebook uh, somewhere exotic or living overseas, running a medium-sized business. I'm like, well, that's, that is um, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's. Um, I th I'm encountering more and more people are doing the sort of thing that you're doing. They're finding that with um, modern attitudes and um, modern technology, it's possible to actually yep. uh, to be running your business in a different way. Yep, yep. And I think but COVID has probably spurned that on for a lot more people. So I was well when I go into it, I was this was happening before COVID, but I think a lot more people now are thinking, well, you know, I didn't have to go to work for two years. Do I have to really go into the office? Why can't I do it from um, an exotic place? Yeah, that's right. And first, the idea of working from home, but then, well, your home can be pretty much it anywhere. Right. Exactly. We have more and more businesses operating like that using uh, virtual assistants in other countries. Um, yep. yep. And uh, it all works. Um, but I, we'll get onto that topic in a little while first. I think I'm going to talk about the topic of depreciation, which is a, a timely thing to be talking about this time of year. Is, Tax yep. is probably top of mind for a lot of people. Yep, yep. So should I take over the slides and start talking tax or you've got some questions you want to fire away? No, I think you should um, launch into it and um, I'll um, get into your presentation. I'll interrupt with perceptive questions as we go along, no doubt. Okay, sounds good. So now can you see my screen? I can. I can see your opening slide. Fantastic. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Thanks for having me again, Terry. I'm excited about this one because it is split into two parts. Um, why is that? There we go. Part one's obviously going to be my pet topic on depreciation. And it is timely this time of year, um, being tax time. This is our busiest period. But it's also timely, I think, because of the interest rates. Um, and there's one quick way that if interest rates as an investor is affecting you and you're not claiming depreciation, to offset some of those interest rates with a depreciation schedule. And I'm going to go through an example of um, not claiming depreciation versus claiming depreciation and how it affects your cash flow later on. Before I do that, as Terry said, I'm Tyron Hyde. I'm the CEO of Washington Brown. That's a, actually a bit outdated, that AIIQS. It's an F. I should change that to an F. That means a, it's a fellow of the Australian Institute of Coins Fairs, which means I'm getting old, Terry. Um, <laughs> Because I think well, you've, you've certainly aged compared to the, the photo on the screen. I know, I know. I saw, I know. I, I need to update that clearly. So, why am I here? So, I'm talking about tax depreciation. As a quantity surveyor, we work out what things cost to build. And in 1997, the tax office put out a ruling called TR 9725, which identified quantity surveyors as being the appropriate people to estimate costs where the costs are unknown. And the reason that's important to you is because in Australia, we have very unique laws where part of the what you claim as a property investor is based upon the actual cost of construction, not what you pay for the property, but what, you, what it costs to build at the time of construction as well. We're one of the oldest QS firms. Washington Brown's now been around for approximately 43 years. I wasn't obviously the founder of the firm, but I'll tell that story in a second. We're nationwide. Um, in fact, we do reports all around the country and all around the world now, to be honest. We do a fair amount in England, but with some of the exotic places we've um, done work for, it's pretty interesting. 
now, so what's my real story? As I said, I don't, I didn't, I'm not the founder of Washington Brown. I would say I'm actually the co-founder, but not 42 years ago. And the reason was that Washington Brown was originally purely a traditional quantity surveying company, um, which when I say traditional quantity surveying, me- estimating costs for banks and developers and doing progress claims. Because when you borrow, say, $10 million to do a project development, the bank just doesn't give you 10 million bucks. They will want you to, they'll want an independent estimate um, and then each month we go, we would go out and pro and do a progress claim and maybe certify a million dollars. And that million dollars would go from the develop, developer, sorry, from the bank to the developer, to the builder, and then passed on hopefully to the subcontractors. And that was the basis of the business. But in about 1995, I wrote a thesis on tax depreciation. And then when those, when that law came out in 97, I'm like, well, this is my good opportunity, a bit of luck. Why don't I start up a, a business uh, within Washington Brown doing depreciation schedules. And so I went halves with the, with the Brown of Washington Brown and, um, and that business grew and grew and grew to the point where I could actually, instead of being a cadet, I could buy him out and end up owning Washington Brown. And what got lucky at, what, at around that time in my life, um, in 1995 or six, Harry, we met Harry Triggerboff and he, um, he, he, was, he was doing his own depreciation schedules and he wasn't doing a very good job of it, I can tell you. And so we took over that business. And 27 years later, we're still doing reports for him, um, which is great. In fact, it's a funny story, Terry. The other day, I, I had a meeting with him about a week ago. And uh, I didn't see him during COVID because obviously, you know, he's, he's, he's getting old. or He wasn't inviting strangers to his office. But when I went and saw him, first thing he said to me was, you're looking old, Tyron. Here's a 91, <laughs> 91-year-old telling me I'm looking old. Thanks, Harry. So anyway. I'm not sure everybody knows that Harry Triggerboff is is Meriton, um, yeah. uh, probably the biggest developer of apartments in in Australia uh, any time in the last 50 years, probably ever. I think his net worth is $26 billion last year. And, and like so many people are being super successful, he still goes goes to work every day. Every He's day. Every day. Every day he goes still. Every, every day during COVID as well. Yeah. Anyway, so what is that? Let's get back to the basics. So what is property depreciation? Well, just like you can, if you're a trader, you can claim the wear and tear of a ute against your taxable income. As a property investor, you can claim the wear and tear of a property against your taxable income. It has to be income producing. You can't do this on your home. However, if you did buy a, um, say, a brand new property uh, and you moved out after two years, you can start, uh, and you sorry, lived in it for two years. Once you move out, you can then start claiming those allowances, but you can't claim it for the two years that you lived in it. As I said before, countries have varying laws regarding this in america it's based upon the purchase price uh, we have a very unique set of uh, laws here where it is based purely on part of it's based on the purchase price the ovens and dishwashers but part of it's based upon the construction cost of the of the um of the property so it's very unique in australia i think it's a good mix to be honest um but in summary when you give you a depreciation schedule you pay less tax and how does that happen well, let's say we you were on a hundred thousand dollars and you pay tax on a hundred thousand dollars if we give you a report that says you can claim ten thousand dollars in depreciation in the first year, you should have only paid tax on nine grand, and so that difference is a ten thousand dollar depreciation schedule, and that marginal tax that you would have paid, you can get back. So there's two types of allowances. There's a structural allowance, which is the Division Forty Three. That's the bricks, the concrete, the structure of the building, and the ATO. Oh, sorry, in order for, to claim that, the property has to be built after nine eighty seven. So if you buy a property that was built in 19, um, 1980, There's no Division 43 allowance, no structural work. It has to be built after 1987. And it's based upon the actual cost. So as quantity surveyors, if we were to buy a property that's 20 years old, what we do is we work out what it costs today to build, and then we factor it back to the cost 20 years ago. And how do we do that? Well, we think use a thing called the building price index. So just like the CPI index, we use the building price index, which is a combination of you know um, trade, uh, uh, labour and materials. Fun fact. The building price index has never gone down and I don't think it ever will in history, but it obviously goes up. At the moment, I read the other day, the building price index is forecast to go up 10.4% in Brisbane, which is a pretty big jump. Second part of this equation is the division 40. This is the plant and equipment items, the ovens, the dishwashers. This stuff's going to wear and tear quicker. And so therefore the ATO um, has identified that you can claim it quicker. So the bricks and concrete, you have to claim over a 40 year period whereas carpet might be over a 10-year period. And that's because it gets wear and tear on it, people walking on it. It's going to be replaced quicker, which makes sense. It's the loose items, the things that you can remove easily. Carpets, blinds, oven, life fittings, um, 
they also include um, t um, floating timber floors, for instance, and lifts. So it's not just, it's also common property items like the fire extinguishers, the, the fire hose reels and the lifts and pool pumps. And the more of this stuff, the greater the depreciation because this stuff gives you a faster depreciation um, as opposed to the bricks and concrete, which go on for 40 years. Doesn't mean it's a better investment to get a higher depreciation report. Just means that it's, it's going to, to give you a higher depreciation number. As I said before, we do work all around the world. These are some of the countries we've done some reports in. Dubai, South Africa, Bali, but we'll go on that. So what's changed? There has been some big changes in our industry, um, which was a bit of a shock to everyone. What changed? Well, in the good old days, we would go to any property, whether it be brand new, this is residential only, brand new, secondhand, 100-year-old property, and we would estimate what you paid for the plant equipment items within that building. So it... Um, even if the property was 30 years old, we would still say, well, as part of that purchase price, you have paid something for the oven and the dishwashers and assign a value to that and start the claim on that, which is what we would do. And that's the things like the ovens and dishwashers. But what the government said was, oh, sorry. And so there's a building allowance, as I said before, the Division 43, there's been no change in that. But what the government did, they've changed the way that you can claim plant equipment on the secondhand assets. And as of now, if the property is one day old in residential, you can no longer claim the plant equipment items anymore. So yeah, so they did that to deny income tax deductions for the decline in value of previously used depreciating assets. So as I said, even if it's one day old, you can no longer claim the depreciation on those items. And why do they do that? They said this was an integrity measure to address concerns that some plant equipment items are being dep depreciated by successive investors in excess of their actual value. And they were right, to be honest. They, they were right, but they came at it with a sledgehammer, in my view. Um, but they were right in that we were, as quite as far but the law was such that we could revalue these items continuously. So even if the property was 50 years old, we'd say, well, hang on, you paid a million bucks for a house that was built in 1900. As part of that, the land value is 500. You just paid 500K for something. And within that 500K was an oven. So we had to assign a value to it. It's like saying, if I buy a computer for $2,000 and I've depreciated down to $100, but I sell it to you, Terry, for $500. Where do you start the depreciation? You'd want to start at 500 bucks. And that's what was happening in the property industry. In, in, the, real, in, in the property industry. And that's why they wanted to stop. So it was complicated, but there was an easier way, which I'll go through in a, uh, later on. So the bad news. So no more previously used items. You can no longer claim ovens, dishwashers, lights, air con, televisions all the furniture in the property, all that stuff, carpets, even if it's one day old anymore. That is the, and in common property, it's things like lifts, smoke detectors, common carpet, garage doors, lots. There was some good news. I'm not just the bearer of bad news. They didn't change the way you can claim new property. So if you buy a brand new property, you can um, still claim all the plant equipment and all the building allowance, all the structure, which they would never change that because so many developers rely on the depreciation numbers to get sales across the line. And we all know that we need more housing. And one of the ways to get housing is to buy, sell it off to plan uh, property investors. And the way they do that is to show that property doesn't cost them a lot of money. If you took out the depreciation numbers, it does will, will cost you more money and they don't want to do that. Developers need pre-sales to get funding. So Tyron, what, how, how do you define new property? What does that have to be to be classified as new and qualified? brand new so one of my examples later that i talk about is even if say i bought a property um three months before say i bought a property six months before settlement and i sell it to you terry three months before settlement so we have a dual settlement day um i settle with the developer i then give you the keys i, I then settle with you so, say i settle with the developer at 11 o'clock i i then settle with you at three o'clock even though neither of us have ever been in the property you just bought a secondhand apartment so what it comes down to basically that GST has to be paid on the property. That's it. So even though it's a dual settlement, no one's been in the property, it is considered secondhand, which is a bit stupid. No one's even turned on the oven and it's secondhand. So the other good news was the property, um, it's been grandfathered. So anyone that, that bought a property before this, before 2017 on the date uh, will still be able to claim the way they were. There was no changes to Division 43 deductions, which is the structure of the building. And that represents about 85%, which is great. But the problem is that as an investor, you don't, you, a lot of investors rely on the depreciation deductions early on, which is all the depreciation of the plant equipment. The, I'll show you the difference between uh, this soon.
but the earlier years now on something that's one day old or two years old is dramatically changed compared to what it is if it's brand new. There was no changes to office industrial, which is kind of silly. So we can still revalue air conditioning plant in an office that's 50 years old, but we can't do it for residential. Don't ask me why. Well, I do know why, because the lobby groups for the, for the commercial space are a lot, a, a lot uh, stronger than they were for the residential space. Renovation. So if you renovate a property, even though, so even though the property might be built in the 1900s, it might be an old terrace, if you put a new kitchen in, you do start again. So provided you buy that brand new, put a new kitchen in, and the property's built you know, way old, you can still claim it. If you put, then put a brand new oven in, you can still claim the depreciation. So renovations still count. Let's show me the numbers. According to Hotspot, you know, that's actually watching Brown, but I just thought I'd put your logo there, Terry. So, thank you. Thank you. Brand new a unit. For, so, let's say it's a brand new unit or house for 850. So, that's today. I'm comparing, I want to move my little box here. So, if, you, if you're buying a brand new property before the budget, when this announcement occurred, you could get $20,000 in year one. Post budget, now $20,000. No change at all because it's brand new. Makes sense. But what about if the property was built in the year 2000? 850K. Well, before the budget, before 2017, you'd be able to get $15,000 in year one. Now you don't get six. Year two, 13,000. Now it's six. And the reason is all the difference between the 15,000 and 6,000, that's the plant equipment that you used to be able to claim. So by about year 10 or year, year eight, it's roughly the same. It peters out because you're getting those fast track items early on. But it's a big difference. That's a $10,000 tax deduction that you're not getting. So even if you put this in perspective, even if you were to buy a brand new property today and it was 15,000. If I sold it tomorrow, you would only get 6,000, Terry. So it's a big difference if it's one day old even. Now let's look at a property that was built. What have I got there? I can't see it. So 1986 before the, the 9, remember I said before, the property has to be built after 1987 for you to claim the structural, the building allowance. Well, before the budget, we would still find maybe $17,000 worth of plant equipment in that property. Today, if this property's had no renovation, you'll get zero. So if, we, if you said to Washington Brown, look, I bought a property built in 1980, hasn't been renovated, is it worthwhile? Well, you say yes. Now we say no. <laughs> Simple as that. But that said, there's not that many properties that we get asked to do reports on that are old, that haven't had some renovation. Um, so, yeah. So let's, let's look at this uh, from a cash flow point of view, as I said I was going to before. So on a brand new property, so let's assume it's the same purchase price for all properties. And I'll compare this to brand new to something built after the 1987 till last year and something built what before 1987. So the brand new property, the rent received for everyone here is the same. I'm assuming the same rent, 36 grand. Interest rates at 5.5%, $33,000, same interest rate. The expenses are the same at 1.5%. So it's all the same at the moment. So the net outlay, that is, how much is going to cost you to own what you're actually physically paying out because you've got $33,000 in interest and expenses of $11,000. You're getting 36 grand in. It's going to cost you $7,850 out of your pocket after you pay your interest and expenses. But on the brand new property, you get a $15,000 tax deduction. And so you've got a total loss of 22 grand. Okay. But I get, because I've got that tax loss, I get a tax refund of $8,455. Now, remember, I said before that your net outlay of depreciation, so your net cost was $7,850. So if I take that tax refund of $8,455 and give it to my bank and say, well, I paid out 7850, it's actually paid me $605 to own. I get it, it's cost me, it, it hasn't cost me anything. It's paid me $12 a week to own. Let's compare that to, the, to a property that's built before 87, where it's all the same expenses, same net cost, but I'm not claiming any depreciation. So my tax loss is still only the $7,850. So I can only get a tax refund of $2,905. So it's cost me by roughly five grand a week to own. So it's per week, it's cost me a hundred bucks a week to own. So it's a big difference. So if you compare that to the same, if you just were to do that, the same scenario of brand new, but didn't claim depreciation, well, you get the same result as something built before 87 because you have a $0 depreciation. Does that make sense? So the depreciation number is putting you cash flow positive. So you can still, you could still buy that brand new property and not claim the $15,000 in depreciation. It's not going to pay you 12 bucks a week to own. It's going to cost you 95 bucks a week to own. 
That's the difference. And that, if you say so if you're not claiming depreciation, well, that's how it can off, help offset your rise in interest rates. Boom. So this was um, just be, when after they announced this uh, budget, they um, they asked me, the Treasury Department asked me in to discuss this topic with them because I I you know know a little bit about this stuff and asked them for my advice on it. I told them, well, I think there's a far better way. I think you've come at this with a sledgehammer. It's so simple. The solution was. Let's say we've got carpet, opening value of $3,000. If you sold after five years, and carpet has an effective life of 10 years, if you sold after five years, there's $1,500 left, which you can then claim. Now, if the purchaser bought that house or unit after 12 years, well, there's $0 left because the carpet lasted 10 years. You shouldn't just have to keep revaluing it. The carpet was 10 years to begin with. The same carpet's in that property after 12 years. Well, no one can claim it. And we do this all the time when they said, well, how will we know? I said, well, this is what we do. And they weren't, they said, but if we stop, they said to me, if we stop, if we, if we do what we're about to do, will we stop the excessive rolling depreciation? And I said, of course you will. But what you will also do is you'll incentivize property um, spruikers to, to be able to show people, well, hang on, this brand new property gets X, Y, Z, but this one dollar probably doesn't. And so I don't know whether that's going to be a good thing either. So seven crazy facts about this uh, these new laws. First one was as I well this is the same I gave I gave this example early on Terry um was um was foreseeing the future then um about the the same day settlement which is kind of bizarre isn't it that the same you can have the same day settlement no one's ever been into the house yet it's deemed second hand according to these laws I don't see some of these things I don't really think they thought about the practicalities of what we do um so why pick on residential if if what we were doing as quantity surveyors was so bad why can i still go out and value an industrial shed that's 50 years old and and say that 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 air conditioning unit is still can be revalued now this is the bizarre one so what about so we we've, we've i've obviously highlighted that secondhand residential property um you can't claim the plant equipment but on a on a commercial or non-residential you can so what about a property like this where you've got a retail down the bottom you might have the same carpet going up the stairs into the house upstairs. We have to cut off the carpet at one point and say, well, you can claim the carpet on the downstairs, but you can't claim the carpet on the upstairs. You might have the same air conditioning system that goes through the whole house and the retail shop, but you can claim the half of the retail on the bottom, but not the top, the air conditioning down the bottom, but not the top. Pretty silly. And even going back on air conditioning, air conditioning has many different parts. It's got duct work, which is part of the building now. And now you've got, You've, so you, and you've got um, controls, motors, um, that are other parts. We have to break it into seven parts. So you might have the same air conditioning ducting that goes through both parts of the building on the retail and in the scenario before. The ductwork that goes through the building and on the retail and then up to the top level, which you can claim because ductwork is the building allowance. But the controls that might be in the that there might be a joined to the same unit. The controls on the top floor you can't claim, but the controls on the bottom floor you can getting a bit technical i know but it's just highlighting the intricacies of how some of these laws didn't um couldn't have been sought through thought through bigger is better now if you're a large trust fund like say you're at macquarie bank and you package up 100 uh residential houses they will be able to claim depreciation on the secondhand plant and equipment items provided you've got a certain amount of members so a large super fund could claim the depreciation if they claim if they bought secondhand properties but not your individual super fund. So you have to have a certain amount of members to override these rulings. Same as if you're a company. As a company, if I buy a property in my company, I can claim the depreciation on secondhand houses as opposed to me as an individual. You don't even have to have certain members. As long as it's a PTY limited company, you can claim the depreciation on a secondhand house. Pretty bizarre. And here's another one. When a renovation is not really a renovation. Now, this, this happened to me recently. I, I sold one of my units. Um, I did a $20,000 makeover, new oven, new carpets, new blinds, et cetera. Never used it because I knew I was getting it ready for market. Put it on the market. That person that bought those, even though I never opened the oven, they couldn't claim the brand new ovens because that was considered um, secondhand, even though they were never used. So some people, I think, with these new laws are living in the past. I think this has affected our industry and the way that we've gone about business um, that with, because you can only claim the structure of the building now, um, in our view, we assess the properties individually. I made a little video about it. Uh, what, when, when an inspection is needed and when it's not these days. 
So let me play that video if it plays. Uh, always fun looking at yourself and uh, listening to yourself. A bit weird, isn't it? Anyway. <laughs> so, so you're telling us that um, the fact that you don't actually need to physically inspect a lot of properties means that the cost of getting the, the job done by Washington Brown is, is less. Yes. If, if, if we assess that we can do it without that, yes, absolutely. We bring yeah. that, we pass that on to you and also you get it quicker. Um, so, yes, um, as I said, we've got, we've been doing this for 42 years. We've got a lot of buildings under our belt as well. Um, and so I, I, yeah, I, I, it's just, so we, we assess it case by case, basically Terry, but again, also with you, if you've got the, um, the, like we do a lot of house and land packages as well, look, there's no more accurate way to, to, if we go out if we, to, to get the area of a building, well, basically, firstly, if you've spent $350,000 on a building contract, that's where every quantity's value is going to end up 350 K, right? What we are measuring when we go to site are the carpets, um, for instance. Now it's it's more accurate to measure those carpets or plans than it is to go with a with a um, with a with a long tape measure, for instance, right? And that's what traditionally quantitative do. We actually know how to measure off plans, and that's what we do. Yeah. All right. Okay. So as we said, we, right. we yep, sure. Just before we we go into part two, just want to let everybody know that um, you can give us your questions and your comments by um, typing them into the Q and A panel or the chat box. You should see both of those in front of you. Uh, let us have your questions. Um, in uh, 15 or 20 minutes, uh, we will turn our attention to your questions. So don't the, miss this opportunity to clarify some of the points that um, you're not sure about uh, that uh, Tyrone's been talking about in the webinar so far. Cool. Thank you. So as I said, this is uh, unusual. I've just been working on this uh, second part today. It's um... Yeah, I've never really done a, 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 a webinar on Bali, but uh, we'll see how we go. Eh? So as Terry said, this is broken into two parts. And look, when the laws change um, and, the, you know, the, the government said, come and talk to us about this, I, we, I was in, you know, a bit of a quandary. We, we, um, we didn't, as a quantity industry, we didn't really know what was going to happen, whether we, how, what any of our business were doing, like, as competitors, we don't often speak to each other, but at that point, we were speaking to each other and going, what are we going to do? This came out of the blue. Um, so I did the only natural thing that I could do. I threw a party. For, I hired out the Australian Museum and threw a party was the first thing I did uh, in 2018. And um, that's a natural thing that we did here for... That's the brown in Washington Brown. That's me. <laughs> we decided to hire out the museum because we're an old company.
Bernard Salt. <clears throat> So this was uh, to celebrate 40 years in business, is that what? Um... Yeah, it's, um, it was good. It was a great party. And then I did the next natural thing. I then took my family to, if I can move this, why is that not going away? Sorry. I took my family off to live in a, I told all my staff, or oh, I'll go into what I did with the staff recently, but I said, oh, we, I took my family off to live in Bali and took them to a place called the green school where so my daughter could attend this uh, green school, which was a fabulous experience for two years. We planned to go for one, but we liked it that much. We went for two. And this is a school where everything is made of bamboo. It's these are the classrooms. There's no air conditioning. There's not drop toilets. There's farm animals on there and they promote environmental and entrepreneurial skills. Um, and they learn out. They learn as much outside as they do in. You know, they, instead of getting a, um, a a triangle out, they'll they'll build a pyramid and try and work out the angles out there. They they learn to to farm rice, but they do all the other traditional stuff as well. But from a property point of view, it is amazing. This is what they call the heart of school. Everything is bamboo, as I said. Um, they have a bio bus, so the kids created a bio bus there, which is run on used cooking oil to get to uh, the kid. That was like the year 12 project. They don't have a HSC type arrangement there. They have to give like a TED talk that they work on for the whole year. And one of the kids' TED talk was how to run this, the, the, the bus, the school bus on, on a bio bus, and that's still in operation today. Um, at the end of each day, kids from the local uh, community, if they bring in two kilos of plastic, they get free English lessons. So once the Western kids, are, well, not all Western kids, but um, once the kids have left during the day, 300 Indonesian, local Indonesians come in and they learn English, provided they're bringing two kilos of plastic. There's daily tours. If you ever go to Bali, I really recommend you doing a daily tour. You have to book it in advance, but the, the, the structures are amazing. And um, there's like the biggest bamboo um, buildings in the world here, and it's really worth seeing. This is the gym that they've created, uh, which is used. The flooring is from recycled um, airline tires, which is a recent adjust to it. Um, there it goes. So while we're doing that, while I was running the business, my wife was learning to farm rice. She uh, went and did a, they did a 12 week course on farming rice. And I was working, I was working from a business point of view, because it's not just a travel diary for Tyrant. Uh, Terry was more interested about how I actually, how do I manage to do this? And in Bar well, the first thing we did a rec a recce over there, we could make sure, you know, the internet, this was before COVID, make sure there was enough internet. And now there's a lot of places in Bali, uh, like a WeWork situation and a lot of digital nomads there. I think I was the only one that I really knew that was running a, a business back home. Um, most people that were, were there were running, you know, online businesses, but I'm sure that's changing. At Green School, they actually had a place called the bridge. This is not it, but they have, they built a, they, they encourage you to stay there. So half the parents would stay there and they created, because so many parents were hanging around the school, they actually created a, um, a we work at school called the bridge, which had, you know, fast internet and they'd have talks every day. And like, it's like being at university um, and fantastic speakers would come through, whether it be environmentally or, or how to buy property in Bali, and lots of, lots of different things like that. That's a bridge, as I said. The other thing was good while we went to Bali. We originally wanted to go to Italy because my wife's Italian, uh, but the time zone was it's just a no-brainer for Bali. It's only two hours or three hours, depending upon the season. Um, so that didn't affect my business at all. Um, so in terms of staff, that's the key one, right? So this was a situation where I had, um, you know, that we didn't know what the business was going to look like after these laws change. Um, so I sat them down. I said, look, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is I'm going to put you all, so this is like seven key staff. I said to the seven key staff that were on you yeah, quite high weight, I said, I've got good news and bad news. Bad news is I'm going to put you all on minimum wage. And there was, there was a bit of a hesitation. I said, the good news is I'm going to give you profit share. And so we're all in this together. And um, it took a little bit of coaxing over the line and there was some issues, you know, there's obviously some issues early on, but it's now been great. And there's still not one of them have left. Um, and I can only do this. Let's face it. If I was a plumber, a solo plumber, this wouldn't have been. This wouldn't have been able to do this. But the staff that I've had have been with me for so long. I think the average length of an employee of Washington Brown is like eleven point two years. And the people above that that were in the profit sharing range, they're even longer. So they know the business. They they run. You know, one of them's head of marketing. One of them. One of them's head of sales. One of them's 
you know, in, in quantity surveying, et cetera. So they've been with me a long time. And that's, and that's, I think you do need that, um, that kind of scale to be able to do something like this. You, oh, well, not necessarily, but it certainly didn't hurt. Um, and the good thing about this was that the bottom line, so that actually before I did this, they all wanted big Christmas pies. And they, <laughs> now they don't seem to want to spend so much on the Christmas party, Terry, because the bottom line is impacted <laughs> and it affects them, you know. Um, and it's not so much we need to hire a big boat and have a Christmas party. Let's just go to a, you know Italian restaurant. Um, so, so Tony, just how important is this element of, of what you've set up the ha having your key people on profit share is that an essential element of, of you being able to to essentially run the business from bali i think it was for me particularly at that time i think i know some other people have done it and haven't done that but i think if i i definitely think that that certainly helped and look it, it and to this day as in my next slide like we were COVID ready we we'd always put in place a system that made people rely upon uh, their own self like when I used to when I when I used to we used to have a big office in Pitch Street and I would have 10 people lined up at the debt at my office asking me questions right um, and I'm like uh, and finally since this occurred I don't get as many questions nearly as many questions because they're taking ownership of their role and um, and that comes I think back from the profit share it also put into a direct place a system of answering so rather than five quantity surveyors coming to me, they now go to the one guy that's, you know, that, that gave him a clear head of direction. So it certainly, I don't regret it at all. And it, it's motivational in that I get motivated by making them uh, the profit turnover because I know they, they are. And they're, they're, we're all, we're, we def, definitely are working more as a team now. Definitely working yeah. more as a team. But Philip's asking how many employees you actually have. So well, depends. If you ask the tax, if the state debt revenue office is probably more than I would say we have, but we'd have... 40 so about 40 staff yep it depends so then we've got some in the philippines and then some of the contractors we use as i said that it depends on the, the state debt recovery well, not the, SDR, the, the payroll officer might say well they're a full-time employee i've had that issue before but um i'd say about 40 so and, and size. most of them based in australia or were they about 30 are in australia 10 are overseas yep so they the overseas tend to do more of the admin the all the sales calls are all definitely here, but we definitely have some overseas doing um, formatting of reports because our reports are, can be quite complicated and long. There's certain things that are manually processed and they certainly help there. But yeah, so there's um, certainly decent size. It's about as big as I want it. Yep. Um, so what was my next slide? I think that was my, oh, it's bottom line. Okay. Oh yeah. So let's just say the work from home. So what we did, so when I was in Bali, I sold my office because we weren't, people weren't, because I wasn't at, uh, I wasn't going into the office every day. Obviously, it was unless people, everyone started working from home already. We when COVID hit, we were ready. We were work from home. We we're, we're we're already doing the whole come um, work from home COVID thing. So it was um, a good a good training ground for life after or life during COVID because we were COVID ready when that came. That was just, you know I'm not saying it was a good thing that COVID came, whatever. But it was we as a business we were set up to already be prepared for that. It must be a massive reduction in your business cost. Not yeah. Actually, well, I even mean, the rent. The rent is like well, it's actually my building. So Washington Brown rented the built the um the the suite off me, but it was a sort of it was a huge huge expense. And now the difference in rent alone, um, I won't tell you numbers, but it's it was a, it's it's like a tenth we pay now mm -hmm. um of rent. So, so can I just clarify a point? Um, is it the case that you've set up a business where you can run it from anywhere, or is it the case that you've set up a business where you don't need to be involved at all? I would say that's a good question. No, I'd say I still am, I still am involved, definitely, but a lot less. So I I still like to be involved. I don't know what I do all day, Terry, but I certainly don't. I don't um, like I used to. I used to want. I used to review all the reports, right? Many moons ago, I used to do quotes. I've done everything. You know, I've built this business. So I used to do everything, but now I do. I have systems in place where. Okay, so as an example, I have a chief quantity surveyor, but I will only review reports if there is over a certain amount, right? If they're like a, a $5 million building, for instance. Um, so I de-risk those certain elements of what I need to actually be involved in based upon also about my PI. So um, so I de-risk it. So it, and also, I my staff know that if I have to review a report, I need 48 hours notice to do it, right? So don't come to me with a report 
that needs to be done in 10 minutes. It's not going to work. I, cause I, I might be overseas. I might be, you know, I, I, I want to do this again. I'm hopefully we're, I'm talking about, um, you know, m- maybe moving to Europe for a period that will be more trickier, but you know, you only live once and I've always wanted to live in my wife's Italian and we did manage to do it from Bali. So who knows, but I, I still like to be involved. I still like doing this stuff. I, I like to um, talk to people. I, but I don't, I don't get involved in, I don't get involved in a lot of the uh, stuff that I used to do. Yeah. Well, we're, we're one of our team members has been living for the past 12 months in Greece. And so there's a, there's a big time zone difference there. Mm. But mm. nevertheless, there are um, work hours that overlap. So it's That's still right. possible to, to have that usual day-to-day communication. Well, uh, I, was just, I was just in um, a client um, flew me over to America to inspect properties in Whistler and um, and, and uh, in other parts of Canada and, and Arizona. And so if you've got any properties over there, you need me to inspect. I'm certainly open to be flown over there to do that, but that's not the point. The point is there, the time zone was really, it was okay because you could, you could go out during the day and at about six o'clock at night, it kicked in Australia. So it's provided you with, you know, you got your day and then I was like, well, I could make a call at seven o'clock at night. It'll be like nine o'clock in the morning here or something like that. It worked really well. Just Europe is a bit harder for sure. So my yeah. wife did write a book about this, um, our, called Our Green Change, which she just wrote. That's my wife and uh, it's Journey to Green School, Bali and Beyond. So if you, if you want to um, learn more about Bali, because it's actually Bali, you know, I love Bali and there's a lot of history of Bali about in the book and also about the Green School and what it's like. So if you're interested in an alternative education system, it's a good, great read because she's a great writer because she wrote half of these books for me. So as a special guest, thank you for coming today. I'm actually going to give you two books if you uh, click. Uh, there's going to be a link in the chat. So keep claiming it, which is all about depreciation. Well, it's actually not all about depreciation. It's about property investment, and part of it is about depreciation. It's about um, I give seven tips about property investment. It's not just it's not just tax law because that might be a good sleep a good book to put you to sleep. But the other book I'm in was in is a book called Secrets of Property Millionaires Exposed. Uh, I've got a, I've written a chapter in that, and I've got. Uh, those books and i'm going to give you those books i think if you click or the click uh, if you click the link that's going to go in the chat there's just a um uh 9.95 postage fee that i that i'll ask you to pay it's actually costing me 14 dollars to post it but i thought that would look stupid so i'm going to make it 9.95 but the books are definitely worth 30 bucks each and so um if you'd like a copy of those i'll send you two signed copies um I don't know whether my signature adds value or devalues it, but it will be on there. And just just to clarify, people want to access that offer, take advantage yeah. of it. The yeah, there should be something in the chat, I think, uh, or it will be soon. Okay, well we'll we'll circle back to that um, before we finish the broadcast. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, so I, I, I it's um that's I. But stuck to your 45 minutes, Terry. Perfect. Um, so I was rushing a little bit there in the early because I, I was time conscious, but uh, we've got to the uh, 43 minutes. So please fire away. I'm curious whether there's going to be more questions about barley or tax. Well, I think there's a bit of a combination that's um, come through already. So we'll just work our way through them. Sure. Um, firstly, about, um, about tax. If you own a property built two years ago and have been claiming depreciation, will the claim stop now that that part of depreciation is no longer claimable. Does that make no. sense? Yeah, yeah. But if, if you got a report from someone two years ago, you well, hopefully they knew the tax law. And if it was brand new, so if your property was brand new, you would be able to, in your report, you would have the depreciation of the plant equipment and the building allowance that you'd be claiming. If your property was, was, um, was, was secondhand at the time when you bought it and you got a report, well, hopefully they haven't put in that you can claim the plant equipment it's just the billion allowance and that will continue to claim um for a period thereafter and it won't change so if it's two if you bought it probably two years ago whatever report you you had should be correct at that time and you should be able to continue to claim those amounts okay and just to um clarify for people the chat box now does have that link if you want to take advantage of that offer free copies of two books i uh, click on the link in the chat box uh philip's asking are there i think you did uh, touch on this in your presentation, but if you could clarify again for sure. Philip, are there any properties where you would consider a building inspection is necessary? Yes, lots. So we assess the properties um, on an individual basis, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Is, is there a rough sort of percentage of those that you, you can do a report on without inspecting? Is, how does I'd it have work? to yeah. check that. Probably 60, 40, something like that, I'd say. Yeah, so okay. it's a significant amount. Um, so we, again, we assess the properties based upon what we, um, what we see. But we, we've, since we've done this for five years now, our, our Google rating has, and our, we do an NPR score every, every week, and our NPR score has gone through the roof um, because of our service. Um, you know, I don't get how some people are saying that every property needs to be inspected. Like when the co- they might already have the cost. Like it's it could be that you could uh, as a quantity surveyor, you could you could be the quantity surveyor on that whole project. Someone buys it brand new, um, and then they sell it as a, one day later. And if you have a carte blanche model that says it has to be inspected, well, in me that's 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 benefiting the quantity surveyor, not you, the investor. If you're telling everyone that every property has to be inspected. In my view, that's, that's benefiting the Qantas layer, not you, not you as an investor and, and analysing your property beforehand. Okay. Now, Brett's asking, or oh, uh, I purchased a display home that was mm-hmm. under construction when we purchased it. Are we able to claim both parts of the pre shaft or just structure as the building had already commenced? So the so okay. So the depends on the but no, that doesn't depend on the. You should be able to claim both the plant equipment and the building allowance. Reason being is that the intent of the developer in that case was never to have a residential. They would have, they're using it as a display home and no one never to be lived in. It's a fun fact that one, and we got a ruling on it. And so yes, you could be able to claim both. So even though there would be some wear and tear on it, you will be able to claim both because the- no well, Is it, is it there. considered more, more a commercial building rather than- Yeah, a for that period, it is. It is. So uh, it's, it's, the, it's, yes, it is. Okay. It was never, sorry, it was, it was the intent was never used as a residential property. So the, the, the scenario where it was, um, where I said the same day settlement, well, the, the use from that period of those four hours between settlement, well, the use then was residential. Whereas a display home, the use is never residential. No one's actually, no, one, no one had the opportunity to sleep in that bed. Okay. Uh, just to remind everybody, uh, take advantage of this opportunity to ask your questions, clarify any points um, or concerns that you've got about depreciation um, in the Q&A panel. Um, now, Philip's asking um, some questions that relate to the lifestyle and the setting up of your business. Um, asking firstly, do you do outsourcing? Um, I think, you know, I guess you might be referring there to virtual assistance, perhaps. Yes, we do. Yep. We're, well, I'm in part of a business blueprint program uh, with Dale Beaumont and there's, they're very big on that. And it's, uh, I, I, we, we love our um, assistance. Absolutely. So we, some of it's IT, some of it's ad- administration. Um, but yes, we definitely uh, have utilized virtual assistance, but they're not virtually, they're full time. They're full time working for us. Uh, some of them have been with us for 10 years. Um, we've been doing this for a while. I think we're one of the early movers on VAs. Okay. He's also asking, do you have any positions vacant for working? <laughs> well, on profit share? <laughs> no, uh, no look, we, 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 we are very busy, but my, one of my, we have a lot of, one of the, a lot of people come and go at Washington Brown. They go and they come back and can't get rid of them, Terry, but I've got a couple of uh, staff on maternity leave at the moment. And, and um, we, we, as a team, we try and look after each other and we, we tighten up and we're working harder knowing that they're going to come back because we want, we want to our... This. So basically what I'm saying is there's already a couple of super subs in, the, in, in waiting to come back. Yeah. Um, if anybody's sort of got a property, they're not sure. Um, they've listened to what you've said today, but they're still not, not clear because there's so many ifs and buts that, um, and maybes around these situations. I just want to clarify, is it worth me getting a depreciation schedule? Because I, I assume there's a fee attached to that. Um, oh, no, there's no fee to find out whether you need one or not. You just need yeah. to send us the, the pro- get a quote on our website and we'll tell you whether it's worthwhile or not. That said, there's not that many properties that it's not worthwhile. I'd say less, probably 1% to 2% max that we say, no, it's not worthwhile. But it's obviously less and less. If you were to buy a property built in Cairns, an old unit that was built in, you know, or some sort of houses we see, it might be, it's amazing what you could buy back in 1994 uh, in Cairns, you know, it might be 150K. Well, in that case, the, constru- the construction cost is only going to be 70, 70, 80K. So you're going to get a maximum of $2,000 in depreciation. It's still worthwhile at a fee of, you know, five to $700, um, but it's not going to be, 
be a massive amount of deductions back to you. Man. So what about the situation where you, you've got a property and you've got a depreciation schedule, you know, five years ago, but over the years you, you, you know, maybe you're putting a new oven, um, you've maybe done some renovations or extensions. What's the situation about getting everything updated? So it depends on the amount, quantum of work that you do. If you were just to put in a new oven, you'd simply give that cost to your accountant. There's no point getting us to double, dip, double, double that. However, you spent maybe like between 50 to 100, it might be worthwhile getting an updated report. Um, but yeah, once you start spending large amounts, definitely. But at, when, you, when you spend the money yourself, that's, what, that's the, end, the, the end of the amount that you have spent is what's going to go in the report. We can't, even though some people ask us to, we can't, if you spent $50,000, that's what you're going to claim. Now, if your accountant can do that as probably as well as, as we can, um, remember, and a lot of people forget that, is quantity surveyors were only identified to identify construction costs where the costs are unknown. We can't, we, if, the, if a developer builds a brand new building and says, here's a construction cost of 400 grand, this is what you have to base it upon. You can't go and get another coin and say, so give me an estimate on this. You have to use that $400,000 because that's the way the law was intended. It, it starts at the point of where the developer gives you a, a certificate, which it doesn't happen very often, but should. And then each subsequent purchase, the develop, you as a purchaser are supposed to hand that on to each buyer, but it doesn't happen. And so what the ATO recognized was that after the first sale, it is okay to get an estimate of the construction costs thereafter because they realize that not many people hand it on because if you're an owner occupier and you buy that property the first instance of the developer what you do is you just put that piece of paper in the bin and then you subsequent come where's that piece of paper oh sorry i don't have that anymore so but i was going around a bit in the circles there but moral of the story if you know the construction costs and it's only 20 grand you wouldn't want to pay us and your accountant to do that you just give that to your accountant there was a question, um, can we claim depreciation on owner-occupied properties? No. So it has to be, in, it has to be income producing. It has to be available to be rented out. Um, but as I said before, if you buy a property and you live in it for two years or five years and then move out and make it an income producing property, then you'll be able to claim depreciation subject to the age of the property. Okay. Um, Another question, can you please explain the idea of add back depreciation to calculate um, capital gains tax? When yep. I sell the residential investment property on which I've been claiming depreciation in the past. Always get this question, and it's a good question, and it's something people should know, um, is that when you do claim the depreciation of the building, you have to put you have to factor that back into your capital gains equation. So, but not the plant equipment. So the plant equipment, the ovens and dishwashers, it's sold at the written down value. So if you buy a new property today and you sell it, all the plant equipment items you claim, you don't have to factor that back in. But what you do claim in the building allowance component, you do have to factor that back in. The good news is you only factor that half back in if, it's, if you've held it for more than a year. Um, so that's worth noting. So put it this way. So say you claimed $100,000 in, in the building allowance over a 10-year period you'd get $100,000 off your taxable income over that period. In 10 years' time when you sell it, well, the first thing you do is you halve that. So you're only going to pay maximum capital gains tax on the 50K. So there's a there's a difference right there. The other benefit of claiming the building allowance is that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in 10 years' time. So you want to, especially at the moment with, with our CPI increases, so you want to get the deductions now. So there's no point not claiming the building allowance Um Unless you've, yeah, there's no point not claiming the building allowance. And, I, and if, if it wasn't the case, companies like mine wouldn't really have a business. Yeah. And I was asking with non residential property, how's the depreciation change? I think what you're telling no. us is that no, just the changes that came in and purely non residential. Just interesting, isn't it? The, the way that um, commercial seems to get off scot free, where residential uh, investors seem to get slugged. It's, very similar to the state budget in Victoria recently when it came to uh, stamp duty. Um, yeah, it seems I'm not sure what the thinking is, is there. It may be a matter of influence. It's funny you say that also, like when people talk about, you know, negative gearing or only holding, you know, let's only allow for two negative geared properties, right? No, commercial never comes into the mix. Well, so I'll still be able to commercially negative gear property. Um, so yeah, it's just, it does seem to get a bit of a free kick, doesn't it? It does. Uh, Joe's asking, given the cost of materials have 
given that the cost of materials has gone up, would this increase the depreciation of the building and other things in the new house, even if the price was locked in lower before the massive inflation hits? It's a good question. I like your thinking. Um, but unfortunately, it's what you end up paying for the construction costs. So, well, if you've paid 500K, if that's in your contract, if the, if the builder puts up his pricing and you negotiate that, the 500K, uh, it goes up to 550. He says, oh, I need a variation. Well, then yet that's where we would use the 550. But if you've managed to pay 500K, the ATO would determine that the building cost is 500K. Unless you could get, unless you, the developer provides you with a, t a certificate saying, well, the building contract was 500K, but it actually cost me 550K. That's an interesting scenario. And it's an unusual one that's, I don't think really occurred in my 27 years because it hasn't really been this um uh this rate of growth in building prices for for a long time you know in the old days they used to have a thing called rise and floor, fall clause in building contracts when i first started and what used to be able to happen was that you would be able to negotiate if the building that there was a set built but building construction baseline and you would have you would be able to say well the builder would be able to say well you know the building prices have gone up seven percent this is the new this is the new contract price and i think that might start coming back into play a little bit which is fair enough. Well, in the current circumstances, certainly. Yep. Karen, we're, we're coming towards the end of our 60-minute our time slot. Um, right. Before we wrap it up, if anybody um, wants to follow up, uh, make contact with Washington Brown and um, organise to get a depreciation schedule done or ask the question whether they should get a depreciation schedule done, how do they do that? What do they do? Okay, they can email um, sales at washingtonbrown.com.au. Um, if you mention, if you have the subject line of Terry Ryder or hotspotting, uh, we'll certainly I'll organise a, a special price for you. Okay. So, so sales, S-A-L-E-S at washingtonbrown.com.au, subject line hotspotting or Terry Ryder, and uh, we'll know where that came. We know that you've been um, on this uh, webinar and um, we'll certainly look after you. Okay, so I refer everybody uh, to the chat box. We've got there the uh, email address to, to click on, uh, to use to make an inquiry about a depreciation schedule. Always remembering the subject line is Terry Wright. That's the magic formula to getting a discount. And also in the, uh, the chat box, we've got the link to get three copies of the two books that uh, Tyra yeah. mentioned. I have to actually go to my storage room because I, I did this way. I did a webinar the other day and I've got a few more order than i thought and i i went down to my garage you know oh god i've got so i've got to drive out and get some more out of my uh, storage unit but uh it's definitely worth it okay but just one last question that just popped up from dennis before we wrap it up tyron yep. he's asking what about builder promotions does that okay so we have to look at the contract so sometimes well so building promotion again it's a good question so where you if for people don't understand, the builder might have, say, you $500,000, but then they say it's you know $30,000 giveaway. Problem with that is, though, like $30,000 might be air con or, or blinds, et cetera. They put in the contract that, that it's, you know, you're paying $0 for those items. It's, it's in the contract. So it's, it's hard to say, well, you actually paid for it. And let's face it, it's probably already worked into the price. We include it, but it's, um, it's, it's, if it specifically says you get blinds for $0, it's hard to, for me to argue to the ATO, well, you actually paid something for it. It says in the contract, you paid zero dollars for blinds. Yep. All right, time to wrap it up. Thank you, Tyron. Um, always love doing these uh, webinars with you because uh, you may very well be the only person in Australia can actually take the subject of uh, building depreciation and tax and make it entertaining and interesting. So it's always fun to have these conversations. Also very interesting to hear about the way you run your business, how you got that set up, the lifestyle that you've achieved. Um, you're living the dream that uh, perhaps some <laughs> people... <don't> <laughs> oh, there, there were some issues at the beginning. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> sure. But it's pretty good. Okay. So just, just remind everybody um, with the um, to follow up and make inquiries, to organise the depreciation report, sales at washingtonbrownoneword.com.au and also the link in the uh, chat box to get copies of those two free books. Okay, thank you, Tyron. It's been great. Thank you. Thank we'll you. Let's do it again soon. Appreciate it. It's been good. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank everybody for your participation, for your, your comments, your feedback, your questions, 
And uh, please do follow up with Washington Brown if you'd like to find out more. Bye for now.